All righty. Well, again, thank you for the opportunity to share what we've done in Minnesota. Two wonderful talks right before me, which is really a pain, so thanks a lot. Um, they're, they're great speakers, and I really enjoyed them. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about some of the efforts of polymer modification, different modification we use in Minnesota. I'll dance through this pretty quick, but again, I want to give you a tour of Minnesota. I want to talk about you know why we're doing the research we're doing, some of the findings related to cracking, some of the findings related to preservation. So of course, Minnesota is a wonderful place, just like many places. Um, gotta love hockey. Gotta love left side after you eat your hockey. Gotta like going to Duluth and seeing the harbor. And you gotta like our transverse cracks that we have in the state. So all those things are wonderful things about Minnesota. Some of the trivia, I think I saw someone else said they were the fifth most miles in the country. I'm not quite sure what statistics are coming from, but you can see where we're at, the total area, population, lane miles, and what MnDOT has for center line miles. And again, we're in a situation where, you know, Thursdays are fun days. Um, it's interesting, we had an article in the Star Tribune from the state of Minnesota talking about that Minnesota's colder than 90%, 96% of the world's population, which is kind of scary. Um, some mineral facts, we've gotten down to as low as minus 39 degrees uh, Celsius Fahrenheit, same thing. Uh, we get quite a bit of frost depth. Um, we hit stretches of the winter where we actually stay froze pretty, pretty long times. So it kind of shows the severity of the winters. It's very similar to the Northeast here. Um, we all have our conditions. You know, here's kind of a snapshot. You can see how there's quite a difference between our northern Minnesota and southern Minnesota. Um, this is not a bad day, eight below. You can still go in a warming house and play hockey at eight below. At 10, they close the rinks. But it kind of shows the temperatures that we have. Um, and, you know, it kind of cuts down on our paving season, you know. So this is a normal July. No. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, this is one of the roads that they had to build. They got behind schedule. This was in December. They shouldn't be paving, but it was really fun to not see the roller go down the road. Uh, Minnesota's broken into eight districts. Uh, just a little background. We have 87, 87 counties, um, and they're very strong. With related, We have a local road research board that provides a lot of research, and one of the reasons Min Road's around because of that local road research board. Uh, we have a trunk highway system. You can see the makeup of the roadways we have. So we got, uh, you know, bituminous over bituminous bit, uh, bituminous over concrete, concrete, CRCP. You can see the percentages there and the miles that we have. So quite a, quite a network to take care of. And the, it's interesting here, if you look at this ADT traffic, um, most of our roads are probably 85% are below um, 100 100,000 ADT, uh, so it's not real high volume, but there are some high volume roads. And I think this kind of points out why we really are looking at research as being the key to kind of get out of behind the curve that we're seeing. Uh, this is a snapshot that we had in 2000. We're looking at the remaining service life, and uh, we were run, running around 14 years remaining service life. You can kind of notice how we have a number of roads with you know, upwards of 30 years of remaining service life, some that are down to zero, and that's not that you can't drive on them, but it's to the point where they really need something done. But what's interesting is if you look at that and then you look at 2013, which is a couple years ago, you can see that tail is missing. Um, our whole system is moving t over to the left there where we got a lot more remaining service, a lot less remaining service life, and this has to do with that we're putting a lot of efforts and money towards new roads, uh, different things that we're doing. It's not on pavement preservation and keeping what we have serviceable. So it's not a good time coming up if you look at that chart. But I want to be positive about this and talk a lot about, about the use of polymers and the works that we've done. Um, kind of the Minnesota story, this is before my time, thank God. but. Um, I guess early on, in the 70s and 80s, there was a big rutting issue. And I think asphalt paving is a pendulum where you kind of go from back and forth. You go from rutting to cracking. So I'm going to kind of show this pendulum a little bit, saying that we had a rutting issue. I've been told, um, you know, in the past, we've designed our roads for loads. We didn't 
didn't look at the environment that much. So guess what we got? We got cracking. And I think in the northern states, we all just kind of accepted cracking. That's the way, we, that's what happens. Um, you know, we have cracks. This is Roger Olson. Everyone, I think, knows Roger Olson and his, and his lovely feet. Um, this shows an airport up in International Falls. Um, again, that's, that's quite a thermal crack. That is really, is, that's not concrete there. So, you know, it really does move a lot. And it really kind of shows today we're, we're doing a lot better. Um, so we're using, in our state, you saw the temperatures, but typical asphalts, a 5834 uh, and a 5828. But now we're starting to design for actually the environment. And I think that's what we learned a lot from Minroad. And I'll show a couple slides there too. Um, some of the original Minroad sections, this was like in early 80s. They were designed in 90s, 92, they were put down. But you can see how we were really smart back then in using a minus 22 asphalt and a minus 28. Um, I'm being very sarcastic here. But uh, they didn't rut. I guess that's one way to put it. But you kind of see the different mixes and the different things we did at Minroad. But I wanted to point out what happens when you use those types of mixes. Uh, this chart shows um, the need for super pave, the need to address the environment. And we looked at test sections that were 64 or 22. Those are the ones uh, that are in blue. Uh, then the, um, the, the 5828, uh, again in green, you can see how the, the 22 cracks a lot. It cracks after a couple of years. Uh, we got down to minus 39, and the whole system cracked after two years in 1996. Um, you can also see the fact that we had five and 10-year test sections, which is interesting there because thickness didn't matter when it came to thermal cracking. It's just the environment. In our low volume road, we had the same type of thing where we had the same asphalt on the whole thing, but thickness wasn't a factor. And there, there was sort of an indication that base type or kind of a asphalt, they call it subgrade drag, but asphalt drag when it gets cold, that the coarser types of base, bases tended to crack more than the finer types of bases. So when we, we started getting smarter after we kind of learned these different cracking that's taking place, and we built uh, three test sections on our low volume road. So we said, oh, oh ha, ha, we're gonna show how these work and how these PG grades, gauge, nah, PG grades can really help out the state of Minnesota and northern tier states. And we built three test sections, 33, 34, 35. Um, what was interesting about it is we thought, oh, the minus 40 is going to be the, the godsend of the Cadillac of oils. But we found that you can use a minus 28 and you get your typical thermal cracks across the road. The minus 34 was really good because we had no cracks, no rutting. But the minus 40 when it itself uh, 35, that oil was absolutely, it was separated in buckets after we collected it. Um, it was hard to manufacture a minus 40 out of the things that we were finding. And that was uh, many years ago, but it kind of shows that maybe too much of a good thing when it comes to modification is not a good thing. Um, so you kind of be realistic, but the minus 34 is really proven out to be quite a success story for us in Minnesota. Just showing that you know thermal cracks when they do happen. Um, this has nothing to do with Palmer modified, but I think it's really interesting on seeing how much water is underneath the pavement, how much drain the need for drainage is. Um, I think that's one thing that we don't talk enough about is drainage and the need for drainage for pavement performance. But we get cupped cracks, transverse cracks that deteriorate, and um, that's one of the big problems in Minnesota how to deal with those. Related to the low temperature cracking and kind of getting the polymer modification is um, we started, this is a, I found this slide last night watching hockey and making my PowerPoint, but um, we had a great group of people that came. I don't know if you can see the, any pictures in there. I should have blown that at full size, but some really qualified people from around the country came and helped us early on in developing a pooled fund study. And that kind of got into the fracture energy, um, balanced mix design, all the things that you're seeing now. But we had a number of states helping out with this. Um, we had four different universities working on this to develop kind of that, that test that could show fracture, who came up with fracture energy with the SCB and the DCT test. 
Um, again, then we had two pooled funds over a number of years. Uh, the first one kind of went without modification and wrap, but the next one went into wrap and modification. Um, but some of the findings are very significant, and I think this is where polymer modification really showed that if you added polymer modification, you got a lot better fracture energy. It really helped out things. Um, it also depended upon the areas that were there. Uh, we had a limestone and a granite. The granite performed much better than the limestone. And, um, you know, wrap, of course, uh, didn't help as much as you'd hope. Um, but it really showed the critical need for the asphalt mixture specification. We, so we selected the DCT at the time uh, just because of the uh, difference in testing results that we got and the variation. And that was early on, and we're kind of looking at this more with NCAD. Uh, but again, this was good field performance because we did take samples that were from the lab. We did take samples that were from the field. Uh, so we did see the performance and match that up with a test that we had. Uh, this kind of shows the results that we got. Again, the idea of the high fracture energy with the 400 joules per meter squared. Um, you can see how when we had uh, low, low cracking, you had high fracture energy when you had High cracking, you had low fracture or lower fracture energy. So I mean that really kind of showed how we kind of came up with the criteria that we had and we've been using. Um, this kind of shows what our road looked like at Min Road, um, some of the work that we've done, and kind of talking about some of the modification that we've used in success stories. Um, we did some stuff where we had a road like that. That again. When you look at a road like this, what can you really do with it? It's not a, it's not a thin overlay. It's not a chip seal. It's not a micro. It's, it's time to do something more than that. And this is where the full depth reclamation came in. And we did stabilize that with three of our test sections that look that bad. And this was done in 2008. Um, and so it's had about um, nine years on it now. And we've, as over, We've had more traffic than we expected the design life to be about five years, so we've gone beyond that. But we use different types of super paves and Nova chips, you know, the minus 34 oils, and we've gotten no rutting and no cracking for that time. So that's really success stories showing how you can use stabilized full depth reclamation with polymer modified uh, materials, advanced designs, and you really get good performance out of that at a lower cost. Uh, we did some other things with uh, Federal Highway uh, and other supporters, but we had some questions about um, acid modified. Um, is that as good as using uh, PP, um, using traditional SBS? We built three test sections, uh, one with PPA acid, one with PPA and SBS, and the other one with SBS. And over the years that we've looked at it, and we used a minus 34 oil, and they all performed perfectly. I know there's been some questions nationally about that, but I think that's, we haven't really talked about that much, and I'm not sure how much acid modified is a big deal now or not, but we saw no difference in the performance of those for that kind of modification. Uh, we also did some sections on warm mix uh, in 2008. Um, we used Evotherm. Evotherm, I can never say that right, 3G. But the idea there, um, we've seen that work very well too. So I mean, it kind of gets into modifiers. We see that as a great compaction aid. We've got great density. We had very, the contractor loved using it back then. I think it is a way of life now. But it just can, confirms that you can get good performance using this warm mix asphalt technologies. Um, so the success story really shows is this Erlen Lukanen put this together for the state of Minnesota, looking at our payment management data. And this is probably where I should have a pointer. But kind of looking at um, some of the early roads that were built. Um, and then what you see here is what we've seen in the last few years. Um, this was done 2012, based off of roads after a few years. But our thermal cracking is a lot better using the minus 34 and using polymer modified asphalts. It's really improved a lot. And this is going to help in our maintenance, going to help us kind of do pavement preservation techniques um, in the proper manner when you don't have to deal with those kind of depressed transverse cracks. So it's been a success story there. Uh, a couple other notes, uh, we did some different things where we looked at uh, the 28 uh, versus the 34, and you kind of see some of the differences in performance. 
Again, the 34 is working very well for us in the state. Um, again, we've reduced our thermal cracking by, you know, 90%, and that's, that's really good news. So this is my transition slide, just the bug main that Minnesota state muffin is the blueberry muffin, which has got to make the main people upset. But my transition slide to um, different things of pavement preservation. Um, this one is more of a crack ceiling one. And I guess I was looking through my slides. And like I said last night, I was watching the hockey game and picking slides and what fun it is. But this one's really kind of nice because it shows the effects of um, when you do seal roadways, and I know this is a concrete road, but you can see up above there, uh, the road is, it rained, the water is flowing off here where the sealant is, where the sealant's not, the water flows right into the joint. And we saw this for asphalt and concrete because we had tipping buckets measuring the outflow of all these test sections. And we saw that you can get about a 89% reduction in water. Um, if you do stuff like that. It's just sealing that edge, if it's a longitudinal joint, an asphalt or a concrete joint, uh, that's quite a big deal. And that really moves the water off to the side. And this is some of the stuff that long ago we've done. Um, it's just kind of fun looking back and seeing that. But that's, that's huge, I think, when it comes to preservation is the same thing. You could use this as a form of, if you do a chip seal, you're going to see that type of benefits of it. Um, fog, fog sealing. Um, Jerry Guybe is actually the one that should be up here presenting this from the state of Minnesota. I'm using a lot of his slides, but he always shows this slide here where, where we have used uh, fog seals and things like that. You can see how it has, it's subtle, but you can see where it wasn't sprayed and where it was sprayed and the effects that that would have on, you would think, long-term durability. Uh, we did some stuff with um, I guess Tom Wood here. He's not here, so I'm safe. Um, but here shows some different things that we did when we first started doing microsurfacing, uh, or not using more of a flexible microsurfacing. And the idea here was is we were using not the asphalt that was used around the country, but the asphalt that was more appropriate for our environment. Um, we were using, um, and I get into it a little bit later, but we had three. Four test sections were, or two test sections where we had um, a poor conditioned road for two or three two cells, a very poor condition with fatigue, rutting, low temperature cracking, something that you would never put a microservice or a type of treatment on. And then we had some sections that were in better condition, and it really was a difference was the fatigue cracking. But we saw that when we did a flexible microsurfacing, we were very surprised and very encouraged that it seemed to kind of bind the road together and buy you some time. Um, this was kind of a, just from an aspect of kind of selling the using of this type of treatment um, that was very strong for the state of Minnesota to kind of see how that can bind the road together a little better and give you kind of healing of those trans, those fatigue cracking. Um, I think I'll pass on the, I was going to show the Tom Wood chip seal video, but one of the things, and then I can show it later too, but the idea was is doing chip seals on high volume roads. The whole idea of um, that's been kind of a, you, you don't do that in the past. But I think we've shown how when you do, you do the proper techniques and kind of go through that, you know, if you do take the time and you do do things right, um, you can get really good uh, performance out of it and also no customer um, issues related to chips breaking windshields and things like that. I think it has to do a lot with um, in Minnesota we we do good roller passes on it. We use the right um, em emulsions. Um, we fog seal it after it's done and that really does help kind of both protect the vehicles that are going to be driving on it but also protects it from snow plows later on in the year. Um, so Done some really good stuff with chip seals. Um, the use of the different emulsions, the CRS2P is what we use, and the, we use a little bit more, I think, in application rates than a lot of people, but it does help us retain those chips and kind of move towards the future on that. Um, we also did some stuff related to the kind of HIMA microservicing I wanted to kind of mention, and again, we're using asphalts that are like a 4934 base asphalt. And the idea there is we want a soft asphalt that's 
both cost effective to use, but also kind of, you know, versus the 6422 that's we know is going to be brittle and it's going to crack. Um, different polymers that we're adding to it, scratch courses. But again, um, this has really turned out to be quite well because we did try to do it on that road I showed earlier. You can kind of see the road there on the left uh, in cell one. Again, it's maybe not a good candidate for it, but we've really seen some good performance out of that. Uh, this was done, I forget exactly, oops. Uh, this was, uh, I forget what exactly, but this was done maybe five, six years ago, and that road is still existing now. So, I mean, it has bought us some good time, um, and we've seen that as very positive, and we've done quite a bit of microservicing throughout the state using this technology and flexible microservicing. And it kind of shows some of the ride data. This is a couple years old, um, but again, it shows the IRI before, in the passing lane and the driving lane. And it's significant, um, the improvement that you got in ride, and that's looking at um, inches per mile. So I've tried to dance through this pretty quick, and hopefully I still served it justice, um, and I've gotten some out of it. I just wanted to kind of mention, too, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing here um, and is kind of both through the pooled funds, NCAT and um, MinRoad are going to be working together in the future. I didn't mention last talk that um, during the test track conference, we'll be talking about kind of the future pooled funds for NCAT and the Minroad partnership. That's going to be really important uh, for the states to kind of talk about how they want to be involved, uh, at what level, what dollar amounts, and things like that. So that'll be discussed in our meeting next week. And again, um, some people were asking about the NRRA. Uh, again, that's kind of a separate pooled fund, but kind of working with the northern uh, use of Minroad facility. Uh, again, that's uh, 150000 a year for states, but for um, associates, universities, industry, academia, um, that's $2,000 a year. And again, that's looking for their involvement in it. And again, pooled funds, a sneaky way about it is if you can't afford it, still stay involved. You're going to get the results anyways in a, in a lot of ways. But again, we're looking for your impact here voice if you have some questions or ideas from Inroad, we're always willing to listen to. So with that, I guess um, the whole idea with NCAT, the idea if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. So we're trying to go together on this. So thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, I just have one question and he's already got my picture. Already already so, uh, and that is when you did your Seal on the interstate, and then you followed over the fog seal. How quickly was that fog seal behind the, the chip seal application? It was pretty much right after. Okay, so it was right Yeah. After. And I don't know if we have time to show the video or not, but we can show, you can look at that later. Yeah, the the links are on there. Okay. And Tom Wood did a really nice job in describing what we do and how we take care of the different situations on the road to have a successful chip seal. Yeah, and I, I have to thank a lot of the people in the state. I, I am not the expert in this area, but we have some very good people with Jerry Guy, Tom Wood, which you are very lucky to have involved uh, with the International Slurry Seal um, Association. He's going to do a great job with that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. That, we've had some really great presentations this morning.